allies countries, mostly the United States and Western Europe, but also including Canada and Australia and New Zealand, and also the so-called EIT, or economies in transition countries like Russia. These are all countries that share the feature of being wealthy, primarily because, or to a large extent because, of their history of tapping the energy stored in fossil fuels. So another way of thinking about it is that these are the countries that have large historic <coughs> cumulative emissions. So if you could count all the molecules of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and put a flag on each one based on which country of origin that carbon dioxide molecules came from, the bulk of the CO2 in the atmosphere at the time of the negotiation of the UN framework was produced by Annex I countries. And so the argument was that because these countries had created the problem, they are also most responsible for solving it. Now here is a chart that shows what cumulative emissions by region looked like um, from 1800, so the early stages of the Industrial Revolution, until the year 2000. So here's 1950, so 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990. So the UN Framework Convention was negotiated right around here. And if you look at this part of the chart, what you see is at the time of the UN Framework Convention, essentially three countries were responsible for most of the cum accumulated emissions. And those three countries were the United Kingdom, with this very large early contribution from the early history of the Industrial Revolution, Germany, which was the next country in the world to industrialize, and the United States. Most of the rest of the cumulative contributions up till 1990 came from the rest of Europe. So France, the Netherlands, the Nordic countries, Switzerland, Italy, etc. So the United States and Europe essentially were responsible for almost all of the accumulated emissions prior to the UN Framework Convention. The rest of the world played almost no role until about 20 or 30 years ago. And so you can see why it seemed to make sense then to focus on the United States and Europe, the Annex One Nations, as having primary responsibility. Now, nation states are one way of looking at the problem, but we can also look at the question in terms of per capita emissions. Because, of course, these countries are not all the same size. So if we divide the cumulative emissions by the number of people in those countries, and obviously this is a little bit tricky because Russia was the Soviet Union during part of this period, so the exact numbers for Russia can be disputed, but the basic picture remains clear. We see the United States, the United Kingdom, and Germany have the largest per capita emissions, that is to say, a citizen of the United Kingdom, a historic citizen of the United Kingdom, has done more to contribute to climate change than a citizen of any other country in the world. Mm. However, when we look at per capita, we also see that Russia and Canada join the ranks of the large emitters, along with Japan, and China over here, and India over here, are still relatively small emitters when viewed on a per capita basis. Now, so one thing that's interesting about this chart then, as I said, we see the United Kingdom, Germany, the United States, and Canada, and Russia are the top emitters per capita. And what do we know about these countries' willingness to accept responsibility for their own historic emissions? Well, the answer is it's not a very nice picture. The United Kingdom, has, in fact, made a significant contribution, I'll talk more about that, to addressing its emissions, as has Germany. But the United States, as many of you know, having originally signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, refused to sign the Kyoto Protocol, which actually defines specific targets for emissions reductions. So the United States has made no formal commitment as a nation state to emissions reductions, none at all. Canada did sign onto the Kyoto Protocol, made a commitment to make emissions reductions, but then withdrew recently from Kyoto, and Canada's emissions, I'll say more about that in a moment, have increased rather than decreased since the time that they signed onto the Kyoto Protocol. 
So of these major emitters, we see the United Kingdom, Germany, uh, and to some extent Japan and Russia making efforts to um, uphold their responsibility according to the Kyoto Protocol, the United States and Canada rejecting the notion of their responsibility. So here are a few statistics. In the United States, emissions are up overall since 1990, which is the baseline year for the Kyoto Protocol. Emissions in the United States are up 10%. In Canada, they are up 30%. That's one of the sharpest rises in the world, um, even compared to many developing nations. And that is compared to their promise under Kyoto of 26%. In contrast, the United Kingdom has cut their emissions 18% relative to the 1990 baseline, and Germany has cut its emissions 26%. Overall, the European Union is on track to meet its Kyoto targets and to cut emissions 20% by 2020. And I think this is terribly important for us to know about on two levels. One, it speaks to the issue that Professor Chu raised yesterday about game theory, that despite the problem of free riders, despite the disadvantages to early adopters of cutting emissions, we see that many nations are indeed still willing to do it. And so it raises an interesting political and social question. Why has Germany been willing to cut its emissions so dramatically when classical game theory tells us that it is irrational for them to do so? So obviously other considerations, considerations involving political leadership, considerations involving their own beliefs about the future of their own economy, can lead nations to make substantial emissions cuts even though certain forms of simple economic models would tell us that they should not do that. So, so as I said, and, and it's important for us to know as well that Germany has one of the strongest economies in the European Union. So we see from this experience that it is clearly possible for wealthy countries to cut their emissions without serious economic harm. We also see from the differences between these different countries, Germany, Canada, the United States, the United Kingdom are all highly developed, highly industrialized, wealthy, educated countries. Canada's in emissions have gone up 30%. Germany's emissions have gone down 26 So clearly, policies, energy, economic, and fiscal policies can have a strong impact on greenhouse gas emissions. So if anyone says that it's just too difficult, it's too hard to do, these data refute that claim. Now what about China? China is a kind of elephant in the room about any discussion of greenhouse gases because of their very dramatic increase in greenhouse gas production in the last 20 to 30 years. In the United States, the rise in greenhouse gas emissions from China and the fact that China is not an Annex I nation covered by Kyoto has led many political leaders, including President George Bush, to say that they are unwilling to support any international agreement that did not include India and China. President Bush explicitly said that it would not be fair to the United States for us to cut our emissions when China was not required to do so. And many Americans thought that was a reasonable argument, not understanding that, in fact, it was fair under the concept of common but differentiated responsibility and the analysis of historic accumulated emission. So this raises the question, how much has mainland China contributed to climate change? Well, this is a terrible graph that I got from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and didn't have time to clean up. But here we see what cumulative emissions look like today. So the chart I showed you earlier really focuses on the earlier period, but now if we look in detail, we do in fact see that today, cumulative emissions have shifted so that the United States, Russia, including the Russian Federation, and China are now the top three emitters as percentage of the total cumulative emission. So here we see the United States at 16 million, uh, this is gigatons of carbon, 9 million for Russia and the Russian Federation, um, and um, about 43 million for China. So 8% for China. Uh, I've lost the percentage for Russia. I don't know where it went. Yeah. Well, Do you see the percent? 
What's that? Didn't see the percentage. Yeah, I can't see it. Ten point eight. Ten point eight. Okay, you can mm -hmm. see it. Where? The United States is thirty percent. Yeah, there we go. Twenty-six point. Oh, okay. There we go. Twenty-six. Thank you. Twenty-six point six for the United States. So a quarter of all cumulative, cumulative emissions. Ten percent for Russia and eight point seven. So just about nine percent. Then Germany comes in next at six. United Kingdom at five. Japan four. India three. France, Canada, Poland going down. So here you see the major countries that we could now say are largely responsible for the emissions, but again, you see a very big difference. So here are top 10, the United States at 25%, Poland at 2%. So a big difference uh, between the top emitters and the lesser ones. So if we look at this as a pie chart, we see now the United States here, 26.8% according to these statistics. China comes in here at almost 10%. Rest of Europe still beats out China at 20%, United Kingdom 5.6, Germany 6.3, Japan. 4.1 in Russia, 7.3. So still, though, the United States and Europe still making up the lion's share of accumulated emissions, but China beginning to be an important and significant contributor as well. But again, if we look at the question of per capita emissions, the picture is different. China, as we all know, is a very, very large country. And when you divide Chinese emissions by the number of people in China, suddenly China falls down again to this very low level. So indeed, we find that the average historic Chinese citizen, so again, this is going back to 1751, has contributed only about a tenth of the greenhouse gas contribution of an American citizen over that same time period. Now, obviously, most of these emissions don't go back to 1751. The lion's share of all the world emissions have been produced in the last 50 years. But nevertheless, we still see the United States way in front of China or India um, in terms of per capita emissions. Um, this was just another chart I uh, tried to produce. I apologize for the bad graphics. This comes from the World Bank, um, who you would think would do a better job. But it's an interface where you can actually type in a country and then get its um, current emissions per capita um, just over the last few years, just to see how the trends are going. So this is the United States up here. So there is a slight downward trend in the United States. Uh, that's the good news, but look at the discrepancy. The United States is still way above any other country in the world in terms of per capita emission at 17.3. Uh, this is in uh, metric tons of CO2. France, 5.6. China, 5.7. So China is now about the same as France in terms of per capita emissions. Uh, and I found data on Taiwan, uh, 3.0. So Taiwan is still quite a bit below uh, France or China in terms of per capita emissions, but interestingly enough, up from, from 1.7 uh, just not that long ago. So rising emissions in Taiwan as in many other places in the world. So in short, China is catching up with Europe in per capita greenhouse gas production and with USA in terms of total annual emissions but still lags far behind the United States, both in cumulative and per capita. No, that's not right. Still lags far behind the USA in per capita emissions, but not in cumulative emissions. One more consideration when we think about the issue of responsibility is the question of how much of China's greenhouse gas production is in the manufacture of goods for export markets, mostly in the United States and Europe. I was not actually able to find statistics on this, but some people have pointed out that if you import a product for use manufactured in a different country, should the greenhouse gases associated with that manufacturer be credited to the country that produced the goods or the credit that the country that consumes the goods? Right now, it's all done in terms of production. But if it were to be done in terms of consumption, then the picture would look even worse for the United States and Europe yes. and somewhat better for China and India. All right, so that's enough about nation states. I want to spend a few minutes talking about a different kind of responsibility, and that's the moral or potentially even legal responsibility associated with delaying action on the issue. My own work with Eric Conway is focused particularly on those individuals and groups in the United States who have consciously tried to delay action on climate change. We know in the United States that a large proportion of American people, some 30 to 40 percent, still think 
that scientists are arguing about the facts of climate change. And so the research that Eric Connolly and I did was motivated in part to try to understand this, to try to understand why so many Americans thought that scientists were still arguing, even though my own research had clearly shown that that was not the case. Well, one thing we know is that studies consistently show that if people think that scientists are uncertain about the reality of climate change, then those people tend to be uncertain about it as well and tend not to support the idea of government action. So if you can persuade people that scientists are still arguing, that the science is unsettled, then those people will be unlikely to support action on climate change. And so in our book, this is what we explored. We explored the way certain groups and individuals had deliberately tried to emphasize doubt, to emphasize uncertainty, in order to convince the American people that the science was too uncertain to justify action. And we know from the opinion polls and data that these campaigns have been quite successful. In the United States today, although the poll numbers can go up and down, in general we find that only about between 30 and 50 percent of the American people are concerned to some, to a serious degree about climate change. And at least 30 percent of the American people still think that it's not, we don't even really know if climate change is happening, or they think, yes, there's some climate change, but it's just natural variability. Studies also show that if you ask the American people, how concerned are you about climate change, we find that Americans are consistently less worried about climate change than citizens of any other nation in America, including China, any other nation in the world, <coughs> including China. And yet, given our contribution to the problem, you could argue that we should be more concerned, and yet we are not. And as I just said, about 30 to 40 percent of the American people still think that the observed climate changes can be explained mostly or entirely by the natural ups and downs of climate. And it's not just ignorant and ed uneducated people. As I mentioned yesterday in my comments on the issue of environmental education, these Americans include some of the leaders, the political leaders in our country, including John McCain's former running mate, Sarah Palin former governor of the state of Alaska. When Sarah Palin was running for vice president of the United States, she said in an interview with the Washington Post that she wasn't sure that climate change wasn't simply part of a natural warming cycle. When asked to clarify what she meant by that, her spokesman said, she's not totally convinced one way or the other. Science will tell us. She thinks the jury's still out. A couple of years after this, I had to do, serve on jury duty in the United States, so I used the occasion to write an opinion piece for the uh, Los Angeles Times in which I said, the scientific jury is not still out. <laughs> um, so this metaphor has been a powerful one for talking about what is going on. So why does Sarah Palin insist that the scientific jury is still out when we know that that's not true? Well, in our book, we explore the work of a group known as the George C. Marshall Institute, led by three rather prominent physicists, William Nuremberg, Frederick Seitz, and Robert Jastrow. And we wanted to know why distinguished physicists like these men would challenge the scientific evidence accumulated by their own colleagues. William Nuremberg was a nuclear physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project and the longtime director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I work. Frederick Seitz, known to many physicists, maybe to some of you, as one of the founders of solid-state physics. He was a protege of Eugene Wigner, the Nobel laureate, and the longtime president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. And Robert Jastrow was an astrophysicist who helped to create the Goddard Institute for Space Studies and played a major role in the United States in the Apollo program. All three of these men were highly educated, highly distinguished, protégés of Nobel laureates, and yet they all rejected the scientific evidence of climate change. So this was something of a mystery for us to understand why such prominent, such distinguished, such brilliant scientists would reject the work of their own colleagues. 
Part of the answer to this question was the discovery that over 20 years, they challenged scientific evidence not just about climate change, but on a host of issues related to the environment and public health, including the reality of ozone depletion, the harmful effects of smoking tobacco, and the reality of acidic precipitation. So why did these men challenge the scientific evidence on all these issues? Well, they started working together and created the Marshall Institute in 1984 to support Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, sometimes known as Star Wars, the idea to create a laser-based missile shield to um, knock out incoming Soviet missiles. The idea was a network of ground and space-based lasers that would defend the United States against nuclear attack. But the idea was highly criticized by many scientists, as well as others, as infeasible and politically destabilizing. But Jastro, Seitz, and Nuremberg, along with a small number of other scientific colleagues, but not very many, defended the Strategic Defense Initiative as necessary to protect the United States against the communist threat. That is to say, they saw this as an essential component of the later stages of the Cold War to continue to defend the United States against the Soviet Union and a possible missile attack. They created the Marshall Institute initially to support the Strategic Defense Initiative. But when the Cold War ended, only a few years later, they began to take up a different but related cause, which was that what they considered to be the defense of free market capitalism. The idea that even though the Cold War was over, market capitalism still needed defending against other threats, now that the external threat of the Soviet Union was gone, against internal threats. And what were those internal threats? They believed that those internal threats were attempts to control the marketplace through government regulation. They believed that environmental issues like climate change and acid rain and tobacco would be used as a lever by socialists in the United States to create a kind of creeping communism from the back door. That the government would increasingly encroach both on the freedom of the marketplace and on the freedom of individuals. So if you ask yourself the question, why would a brilliant physicist like Frederick Seitz defend tobacco, which we know is hugely harmful in so many ways, the answer was because he believed that it was up to individuals to decide for themselves that in a free country, the government should not tell people whether they should smoke or not. And the government should not tell people what kind of fossil fuels they should use to generate electricity. And the government should not tell corporations that they had to control the sulfate emissions on their coal-burning power plants, because all of these encroachments could lead us into a kind of backdoor to communism. Now, in our book, we focused on this one particular group of scientists and one particular think tank. But the crucial part of the story, in a way, is what happened later. The way this message of doubt was spread, not just by these three scientists, but by a whole network of think tanks and organizations in the United States who now perpetuate doubt about the reality of climate change caused by human activity. And this is just a partial list. I didn't have room on the slide for all the different organizations, but some of the most important ones are the Cato Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. You often find the word enterprise because these people promote the idea of free enterprise. Uh, or something like the Heartland Institute because they like to suggest that they are close to the heart of American culture, have the Heritage Foundation. <coughs> or they have these very nice sounding names like Americans for Prosperity. I mean, who would not be for prosperity? <laughs> Frontiers of Freedom. Who's going to stand up in public and say, I don't believe in freedom? Or this is one of my favorites, <coughs> the Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. <laughs> Let freedom ring. So they have these very nice sounding names. They're very attractive. But if we ask ourselves, who are these people really? And who is paying for all of this? What we find is that these institutions are essentially front organizations for regulated industries. 
Or maybe a fairer way of saying is that they, they represent a kind of political confluence of economic interests and free market ideology. But the funding comes almost entirely from regulated industries. As you might not be surprised, a huge amount of the funding comes from the petroleum industry, and particularly from groups that were previously associated with something called the Global Climate Coalition, that I'll say more about in a moment, but also substantive funding from the tobacco industry, who continue to fight back against regulation of tobacco products. In some cases, the mining industry, particularly mainly coal, both in the United States and Australia, the Australian mining industry has become a major funder of these kinds of activities. To some extent, the American chemical industry, also in the United Kingdom, the chemical industry has been important. To some extent, the pharmaceutical industry, and even more recently, the cell phone industry, who mm. recently started a new kind of doubt-mongering campaign against scientists who have claimed that there could be some kind of health harms associated with the use the heavy use of cell phone technology. Now, the role of the tobacco industry is very important, I think, in thinking through the question of responsibility. In the United States, people always like to say it's a free world and we have free speech, but the courts have recognized that freedom of speech does not extend to fraud or to yelling fire in a crowded theater that there are legitimate restrictions on free speech when they put other people's health and welfare and prosperity in danger. And in the mid-1990s, the tobacco industry was successfully prosecuted in the United States by the U.S. Department of Justice for its role in spreading disinformation about the harms of tobacco. And this, of course, raises the question, could the fossil fuel industry be prosecuted for its role in spreading disinformation about the harms of climate change. When I first started raising this question in public, many people thought that was a very strange thing to think. But the fact is that when Sharon Eubanks, the lawyer who led the prosecution against the tobacco industry in the United States, who has an excellent new book, by the way, um, I think it's called Bad Acts or Bad Actors, I forgot the exact title, but it's Eubanks. Sharon Eubanks has a book about her experience when she first had the idea to prosecute the tobacco industry, people told her she was crazy. People told her there was no way the courts would ever take this seriously, partly because she was proposing to prosecute them under a statute known as the RICO statute, which stands for Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization. This was a statute that was passed originally in the 1920s during Prohibition to fight organized crime by gangsters like Al Capone. So many people say you can't prosecute a Fortune 500 company under a law designed to catch uh, gangsters. And Sean Eubanks said, let's try. <laughs> and it worked, and it succeeded. So let me spend a few more minutes then talking about the producers of fossil fuels and their role in disinformation. So in the United States, the disinformation campaign has been funded in two ways. One is what I've already mentioned, through the direct funding of think tanks like the Marshall Institute and the Heartland Institute that spread disinformation. But for many years back in the 1990s, around the time of the Kyoto Protocol, when the key debates were taking place in the United States about whether or not the United States should accept the proto Kyoto Protocol, which, by the way, we helped to negotiate and then rejected, another important fact. But at that time, a good deal of the disinformation was being funded and promoted by a group called the Global Climate Coalition. Again, if you didn't know, you might think that was an environmental organization. Global Climate Coalition sounds like a coalition to protect the global climate, but it's not. It was a coalition to challenge the scientific evidence and prevent the United States from signing onto binding emissions reductions under Kyoto, and its major funders and participants included uh, four of the largest oil producers in the United States and Europe, ExxonMobil, British Petroleum, Shell Oil, and Chevron, which is the original Standard Oil of California. But it, interestingly enough, it wasn't just funded by the fossil fuel industry, 
It was also funded by manufacturers of products that rely on fossil fuels, including the Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Daimler Chrysler, the American Highway Users Alliance, which again, another one of these groups with a nice sounding name, makes it sound like citizens with cars, but it's actually funded by General Motors, and also the Aluminum Association, an interesting connection since aluminum, as many of you may know, aluminum processing requires huge amounts of electricity. So a kind of coalition of the people who produce fossil fuels and the people who produce products that rely on fossil fuels, particularly automobiles. So this raises an interesting issue as well about whether or not the automotive industry in the United States could be held in part responsible for their role in disinformation. So what is the responsibility of these people? Well, one question we might ask is, should the shareholders of these companies object to this misuse of corporate funds? Should investors consider divesting from these corporations, an issue which is being raised in the United States today? So I have a few minutes left, and I thought I'd just say a few more words then about the issue of all of us, and then also add think, just a few more words about the idea of governments other than nation states and annex one nation. Okay. So obviously on some level, any person who gets up in the morning and turns on the lights or even makes a fire shares some responsibility for climate change. But as the evidence I showed before shows, some of us use much more fossil fuels than others. Some of us produce a much greater volume of greenhouse gases than others. The average American 10 times as much as the average mainland Chinese person. The average mainland Chinese person somewhat more than the average Taiwanese. And if we think about truly poor countries like Bangladesh, the carbon footprint of the Bangladeshis, it takes one American to produce the annual CO2 production of 30 uh, Pakistanis. So it's clear that the lion's share of the responsibility of this problem clearly lies with citizens in developed industrialized nations that use large amounts of fossil fuel energy. But this brings us then to the question that was posed yesterday, what is the role of a small country like Taiwan? The fossil fuel carbon footprint of Taiwan is similar to that of France. France is a signatory to Kyoto and is committed to emissions reductions under the Kyoto Protocol. So we could argue that as a parallel, and the quality of life in France is somewhat comparable to the quality of life here. The wine is better there, but the fish is better here. <laughs> so we could argue that Taiwan should think of itself as a country like France that does in fact have a responsibility to begin to cut its greenhouse gas emissions. But I think there's also a more positive way of thinking about it that came out of our conversation yesterday. Small countries can be models. Sometimes it's easier to achieve a certain kind of social or political change in a small country than in a large country. The United States is a very big country. It's a very hard country to move. It's like a battleship. It doesn't turn very easily. But smaller countries can sometimes change their policies more easily and more quickly than other countries. We've certainly seen how Norway played a leading role in the Rio Earth Summit and in developing the whole concept of sustainable development, one that has influenced the entire world. We heard a lot yesterday about sustainable development and education for sustainable development. The concept of sustainability was promoted by the Brundtland Commission, led by Bro Harlan Brundtland of Norway. So we know that people, individuals, and groups, and nations from small countries can have an impact through leadership, through articulation of important concepts. The great ideas of the world have not all come from the United States. So individuals and groups can help articulate ideas, and then they can be models for how these things can actually begin to change. And so yesterday I talked about the Canadian province of British Columbia. It's not a very big province, but it has a carbon tax. And it has a carbon tax that was instituted by a conservative provincial government and that appears to be <coughs> having an effect without damaging the economy. And that's important for all of us to know about. So when people ask questions, we can say, 
Well, let's look at the British Columbian model. Let's look at how it's working there. And let's learn from that experience so we can begin to think about scaling it up. Yesterday we talked, we heard a little bit about engineering. And I went home last night thinking about engineering and scaling. Because virtually every engineer knows that you don't just go out and build a factory right away. You don't just go out and build a new airplane. You scale it. Maybe first you do some bench scale tests. Then maybe you build a prototype. And then maybe you build a full-fledged factory or nuclear power plant or whatever it is that you're trying to design. So I think we can think about small countries as prototypes, that it's possible to think about small countries implementing solutions that then pot potentially could be scaled up on a larger regional or global way. And of course, we have, in the case of emissions trading, we also have smaller models as well. Ironically, from the United States, the United States pioneered emissions trading. The first emissions trading system was implemented in Southern California to control air pollution in a famously highly polluted region of the world. And it's been highly successful in reducing air pollution in Los Angeles. We heard yesterday about how air pollution kills people. Uh, deaths and hospital admissions related to uh, bad air events are way down in California now compared to what they were 30 years ago. And we also have emissions trading for sulfur dioxide pollution an emissions trading pact between the United States and Canada that was passed in the first Bush administration under the Clean Air Act amendments in 1995. So we have models for emission trading. The European Union is now beginning emissions trading. China is also going to begin emissions trading. We have models of those that perhaps can be scaled up. So we're beginning to have evidence about what works and what doesn't work and the conditions under which those things work or don't work. And so I think that's terribly important because evidence doesn't always convince people, but it at least often makes it possible to open up a conversation. And in my own work, I've been stunned at how few people know about these things. I travel all the time in the United States. No one knows that British Columbia has a carbon tax. And when I tell them that, you know, you can often see people visibly sitting up in their chairs. Uh, very few people know about the emissions trading in Southern California. Some people know about emissions trading for acid rain, but they've forgotten about it. So having these concrete examples and being able to talk about how they worked or in what ways they worked and in what ways they didn't are very, very important. So I think small countries are crucial in terms of the possibility of scalable models. And then that, of course, leads to the question of governments other than nation states. So in the United States, we are seeing changes on the state, provincial, North American provincial and city level. Many cities in the United States have adopted energy efficiency. So even though the nation as a whole has not done so, uh, many states have. In California, the average Californian uses about 30% less electricity than Americans in the other 49 states. And we think we live a pretty good life in California. So that's a model to say it's possible for an American to use less electricity and still be happy. Still drive a car. And in California, the state of California, as I said yesterday, has passed a law, AB 32, which commits us to Kyoto level emissions cuts, 20% relative to a 1990 baseline. So it's possible for states to act, even when nation states, as I say states, you know, regional governments, it's possible for regional governments to act even when the whole country as a whole is not ready to act. And in the United States, those of us in California like to take some degree of optimism from what is happening because we know that there's a long history of California leading the rest of the nation in environmental areas. We had clean air protections before the rest of the country. We had clean water protection before the rest of the country. We have some of the best coastal zone protection of any state in the United States. And those laws have been models for other states, and those laws have helped to press the federal government into following suit in a number of important areas. So even though what happens in California is only about one-tenth of the United States as a whole, it can have an important political, social, and cultural impact on the rest of the country. And so the same could be true perhaps here in Asia. If Taiwan begins to take steps towards energy efficiency and switching to renewables and carbon capture, 
I was particularly taken yesterday by the discussion about the carbon capture use and storage because if Taiwanese industries can show that that can be a workable model, then that, I mean, lots of American industries would pay attention, right? So I think all of those examples can be very powerful and important. And so that's a somewhat optimistic note on a very tough and difficult problem, so I think I'll, let, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you.